Turning our attention to the 2024 Women's Six Nations, and we are now two rounds in, with the Red Roses up and running and well on their way to defending their Grand Slam. Joining myself and the columnist today to discuss the state of women's rugby 18 months out from a home World Cup is the last Red Roses head coach, Simon Middleton. After what feels like an extended men's Six Nations season, especially with that British and Irish Lions selection last week, um, do go and check that out if you happen. happen. I was just saying to the other guys, we picked 10 Ireland players in our starting 15 and still got accused of anti-Ireland bias. Um, so go and have a listen to see where that comes from. It's about time we turn our attention to the Women's Six Nations, which is now two rounds into its 2024 edition. Um, where It's quite pivotal, actually. We're less than 18 months out from a home Rugby World Cup. It's obviously a quick turnaround given the delay for the last one. The Red Roses are two bonus points from two, two wins from two. And today, myself and the columnists are joined by a man who has coached the Red Roses at two World Rugby World Cups as head coach and one as assistant coach in their winning year in 2014. Simon Middleton, sorry to disturb your bank holiday, um, but how are you? Um, yeah, I'm excellent, thanks. Yeah, uh, Enjoying watching rather than coaching at the moment. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, life's good. That was going to be my first question, is actually, is obviously this is your first coachless Six Nations in, what, nine years? Uh, probably probably seven, because I was doing the sevens for a little while. Scotty oh, was uh, yeah. holding the reins for a while, and uh, yeah, but about seven. How's the, the, the FOMO, the fear of missing out? Yeah, it's, it's it's not existed at all. I'll be absolutely honest. I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying watching it. Uh, I, I watched the first round, well, the first England game. I watched it round at my at my mum's. She usually phones me first person to phone me on the field after a game. So it's quite interesting. Is that watching it with her and my daughter? Uh, yeah, and then I watched. You know, I had a good weekend this weekend watching it. I probably watched a lot more. Uh, you know, just being able to really appreciate it than. You know, when you're coaching yourself, you just it's all about the team, it's all about you know, so sort of looking at it analytically as opposed to enjoying it as a as a spectacle. Uh, so it's been yeah, it's been great. How does that compare? Obviously, the last time, like like you said, or like we said, the last time you were doing that was eight years ago. Have you been able to sort of compare the watching it as a spectator experience from eight years ago to now at all? I know we're only two rounds in. Oh, uh, I'll be absolutely honest. <clears throat> Eight years ago, I wouldn't have been watching it, to be honest. <laughs> uh, that's, but that's telling in itself, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know, I mean, like the Six Nations was the the sporting pinnacle of the year for me, but it was the men's game. Uh, you know, the, the women's game wasn't really established in terms of its its TV presence as such. Uh, so I think when you look at it now, it just shows a huge transition over the last sort of decade or, or just short of a decade. And day to day, you you took on a role as high performance advisor with Japan pretty soon after um, you left the Red Roses. That was you went to Japan for six months. Am I right in saying? Well, I went all over the world, all over the world for six months. Like the first port of call was Kazakhstan. Uh, they were wow. yeah, yeah, they were playing in the yeah, yeah the World Fifteen qualifier, wasn't it? Yeah, the qualifiers. So it, yeah, it was it, it was real sort of whirlwind. Uh, uh, it, it's working through world rugby, you know, I've, I've got a, a good connection in there with uh, Nicky Ponsford, who obviously was high performance manager for the women's game with England. And, uh, you know, we we talked previously about opportunities going forward if, you know, if things changed after after last year's Six Nations. And uh, and I think just, yeah, I just had an opportunity uh, to work with them. And, uh, and, and I think working with some of the developing nations was something I was really keen on doing because so you spend so much at the, the, the higher end of the game. It's it's you need a change. And uh, and I wanted a real change. So uh, there was a, there was a few options on the table, but Japan jumped out at me because culturally, the language, the challenges there, uh, massive de developing nation and uh and I'd actually met their head coach, Leslie McKenzie, a couple of times. I was really impressed with her. Uh, so, yeah, I, the opportunity came along. And within a week of finishing with England, I was on a plane. As it, <laughs> I thought I was going to go to Japan. I thought, this is going to be great. And then I ended up in Kazakhstan, <laughs> which was also great. Simon, <laughs> as you probably know, Kazakhstan, me 30 years ago when I started covering women's rugby, they were pretty good. And, mm. and they, they somehow dropped off, not dropped off the radar, but they got lost in the... 
women's development program. I mean, did you pick up any vibes as to what had gone wrong there and, and what could what could go right with a bit of uh, a t- love, you know, TLC? Uh, I was, it was difficult for me to to sort of gauge at that point because uh, you know it, it's it's a pretty new environment to me the the developing nations one but one of the one of the things that came to light was like we went uh, I say we <laughs> Japan we, we went and beat them I think by about ninety points eighty or ninety points and the last time they'd played I think that they'd beat Japan by ninety points so so you know Brennan you're absolutely right I think something's changed dramatically. Uh, what it is, I don't know, but they're potentially a nation that I might be doing a little bit of work with this year as well. So I'll probably answer that question a little bit better in another sort of six, eight months. Yeah. They've got some good players that they're quick. A lot of the, like, I, I watch the Sevens quite a lot. And um, Wah- what players like Waka Bahara and Yume Hirano, I don't know how much you've got to work with any of them. Obviously, there's quite a lot of crossover in the women's game between Sevens and 15s but they've got a lot of pace um i think it's the size issue which i think you've spoken about as well it's physicality where there's probably some a little bit of a gap between them and the top nations Mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh it's like you say i think the 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 challenges i mean one of the challenges that jump up straight away with the emerging nations is that it's just the the pool size of players and, and that that requirement for players to cut across uh from sevens to, to 15s and you know it's something we experienced with England obviously sort of going back sort of 2015 to 2000 and sort of 19 and uh until you grow that pool uh and really invest into both programs it's, it's difficult to to get the balance right uh and it puts a you know it puts a big strain on a lot of players <clears throat> because there's such a physical difference between playing sevens playing 15s uh skill sets are different but there's a lot of crossover as well but uh it's it's a, it's a real challenge for players to cut across both let's talk about the red roses um and particularly what we've seen from them in the first two rounds obviously the the, the headline is obviously this is a new era john mitchell mm-hmm. is now established as the woman's head coach he joined up in 2023 but um, now he is head coach what do you think he brings to the table he's obviously He's got quite the coaching track, right? He's had 18 professional coaching roles in 28 years. So it's pretty diverse. And he obviously doesn't stay in one place for too long. Um, there are obviously reasons for that. But what does he bring to the table where you see it? Uh, well, experience and diversity. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's probably from what I've sort of seen at the moment, obviously in terms of, how they how they want to approach playing? <laughs> they're playing like the Black Ferns, basically. I don't know. So no, they're not playing like the Black Ferns. Sort of similar. Uh, I think I think he's and it's, you know, I don't want to sort of try and read his mind as such, but he he looks in himself. And I don't know him that much as a, as a coach, and I've never met him. Uh, but he looks like he's trying to bring a real freedom of mind to the to the team, which I know is a. Is becoming more and more of a trait in 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 the game, particularly from you know from the from, from the women's point of view. I think it's from the men's as well, but from the women's point of view, and you know they talk a lot about expressing themselves and 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 playing from that point of view. And I think that's what you know if you want to make an impact on a group immediately, you, if you can get hearts and minds first, uh, then you know you, you you position yourself well to do some of the other stuff. Uh, and you know you pick up on the dialogue that he's using, the dialogue that the players are using. Uh, you can see how how they're working on that cultural stuff quite a bit, and that that environment stuff. But then again, from a playing point of view, you know you can see categorically what they're trying to do. You know, and, and they've been very open about it. They want to raise the tempo that they're playing at. You can see that. Uh, you can see what it comes with. Uh, you know, in terms of I think I think against. Uh, Italy, they, they just try to play too fast at the start of the game. You know, lots of errors. Uh, but then you look across this week and you can see, well, the second half against Italy and then this week how they just start getting the balance a little bit better between control and accuracy and their error counts come down massively. Uh, and, and they look incredibly threatening. Anywhere on the park, they look like, you know, they're, they're ready to go. And it's... You know, it's it's a type of to a rugby that you know is exciting to watch without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, you know how effective it is, we'll we'll see. But game game plans like that and that type of uh, sort of 
shift, take a little bit of embedding. So you, you know, you can see that. But uh, yeah, they're, they're they're a threat, aren't they? Anyone on the field, it feels like they're a threat. The the, the tempo and dynamism thing, Simon, all all, all um, fits in with <clears throat> with Mitchell's background as as th those of us who who worked with him down the down the years would would acknowledge. I mean, the first I suppose the first most of us ever saw of Mitchell was was playing for the Waikato side that smashed the Lions all over the North Island in in ninety three. And and if you're talking about teams. Starting a game quickly, <laughs> it may be that that Waikato side started the game quicker than anyone else in history. Um, but the, the the sides he became associated with in his, in his early spell as a coach, Sale, um, the England side of the very late nineties, early two thousands, um, they they all played that that kind of high tempo, very very dynamic game. And and if, you know if if you can establish that and and cut down the errors as you say, that's got to be a winning ticket. I mean, some things in rugby don't really change that much, do they? I mean, that that's a that's that's a winning style of rugby if you can get it right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's a like I say, there's a number of ways to to skin a cat, uh, but I think you know, and a lot of it depends on the personnel you've got. Uh, but again, you know, as some of the things picked up in the press this week is, you know, he's talked about their ability to play a number of games, a number of types of games. You know, I think we've always had that, but I think he's because he's really focusing on that that uh, run versus kick or run rather than kick strategy. Uh, then you can see that developing quicker in the side now. Whereas you know, we were we were more structured, more control. Uh, so yeah, you you can, but they've got such a such an abundance of high quality players, not just players, but high quality players who who are very adaptable. Uh, and I think I, I think the girls will really enjoy the England players will really enjoy playing the type of game that that uh, John Mitchell's trying to bring to them. Yeah, for sure. Do you sure. think that they'd be uh, Simon? Do you think that they'd be um, as good at that game at the moment as New Zealand are if they were to play them in this sort of high tempo uh, game? Would they? Uh... Would they be a, a match for New Zealand playing that sort of game or not? I think it'd be it'd be, uh, be a high quality contest, but I, I, I don't think they'd be able to match the Black Ferns playing that game at this point in time. It'll be interesting, won't it? Because as they develop, <clears throat> it'll be a little bit. The acid test will be France when they play France, because France love that type of game. They love the ball on the floor. They're happy to pick up bouncing balls and play. They're happy to. To be, they're really comfortable with a with a really chaotic game, uh, and it just depends how how much England develop and how comfortable they become with that game when they play France. I think if they played the Black Ferns now, which is just that's their game completely, I, I think they'd struggle uh, because. It's they've had a lot of things. England, England will be playing in a mindset at the moment now. We can make lots and lots of errors and we'll still win this game. That won't be the case when they play France. And it's definitely not the case when you play the Black Ferns. And if you try to play the Black Ferns at their own game, you need to be very good at it. Uh, so you know, we'll see. They're, they're going to be playing France at their own game a little bit. And, uh, you know, that, that uh, it's promises to be a, a really exciting encounter. But obviously there's, there's, there's plenty of room to go before then. I know John Mitchell has obviously been head coach in several instances before and head coach of the New Zealand men's side sticks out here. But in terms of his specialism roles, he's been defence coach um, a couple of times in the past decade, most notably with England. He's obviously talked about transforming the attack quite a lot. And we've spoken about Felix Jones and he was obviously mm. South Africa's defence coach. And now he's come into transforming England's defence. What do you make of that sort of coaching fluidity? And do you think... Mitchell being a defence coach and perhaps his expertise more being there, does that net sort of impede him slightly in terms of transforming England's attack or impede the overall process? Uh, I mean, it's good coaches can transition across and particularly really experienced coaches, but you'd probably always have a preference to do something. But my background was very much as a defence coach when I was in the Premiership with Leeds, well, Premiership, then championship, then premiership, then championship with Leeds. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, tr I transitioned across very much into more of an attack coach and then more of a strategy coach as it became, as the head coach role uh, rolled out. And 
I imagine he's probably in that space at this moment in time. Uh, I think he'll really enjoy being here. He's got a lot of experienced players in that in that group, as well as a lot of young players. He's got a lot of experienced players who who will have a lot of influence on how the the, the attack shapes up. And it, and it seems to me, I think there's there'll be a lot of discussion about how the team want to attack and where they think they can develop uh, specific areas of the game. So I think as, as his expertise as just a, a head coach will allow him to to sort of tap into all the things he needs to. So the transition from defence to to attack, I, I don't see it being a huge issue for him, to be honest. Yeah, he he had a very interesting um, transition, actually, Chris talking about his past from uh, playing into coaching John Mitchell, because, of course, he was on the 1998 tour from hell when um, they got uh, murdered <laughs> by everyone. <laughs> and um, so he, he he's had his baptism of fire, no 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 doubt about it. Yeah. And um, I can't remember what – he was an assistant coach, I think, initially, and then uh, moved moved to defence, I think, um, at a stage later on. But uh, what do you think, he, he, you know, just in terms of trying to get that – uh, attacking game to the level of New Zealand's. Is it a is it a fitness issue? Is it a skills issue? Um, what what is it? We know that the the premium that they place on uh, you know handling work that they do off season, touch rugby, beach rugby, et cetera, et cetera. What 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 are the main areas that they're going to have to uh, improve on? Well, I think the, I think the biggest area is is the mental side. Of, of the game from that point of view and being comfortable playing that type of game before you even get to the point where you start talking about the skills associated with it. As I say, you know, New Zealand are brought up on playing the ball in space, moving the ball quickly, being really comfortable at, at offloading the game, uh, offloading the ball during the game and, and being comfortable making errors and then being able to regroup and go again. Uh, and so... I think getting getting the head around that side of the game is is a really big piece. And as I say, it's at this moment they're sat in a, a place where they can make 30 errors, 25 errors in the game, uh, and still know they'll get enough possession to keep trying the game, keep playing the game they want to play, uh, and get away with it. Uh that when you come up against a team that doesn't give you that amount of latitude that's when they'll really be challenged. How do they respond at that point? So if, if they can get on top of the mental side of the game, then I think they've got all the skills to do what they want to do in terms of the game. They've got a, they've got a better passing game uh, than probably any other nation in a consistent manner. You know, you look at you look at France, the, the try they scored at the weekend with the, the quick hands left to right was just sublime, but they'll they'll just as likely put the first pass down or put it on a shoulder and then the play stops. Uh, New Zealand have probably got more accuracy in their longer passing game. Uh, and again, they're very comfortable with being able to just uh, touch the ball without too much fe- uh, space because they've got great footwork and they're brought up on, on being able to beat players in a small amount of space. Uh, but England, England like to play. They're, they're the way they've been built up in terms of their skill set, it's you know that the the accuracy part is a really important part. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how they cope with not being as accurate as as probably they've been in the past. Because when you speed the game up to the level that they're trying to play here, and you're trying to play a more offload game, uh, orientated game, that you've got to be you've got to have better dexterity with your hands. You've got to be able to catch off your shoulder or catch low or catch high and still get the ball away uh, and make good decisions, lots of good decisions. And uh, as I say, you could see that first game in particular, it was very much, we are going to do this regardless what, and there's a real eye error count. You know, they'll have gone away. They'll have, they'll have worked on this week, you know, talked about it, analysed the things that they did really well, the things that they probably didn't do as well. And you can then you could see this week a little bit more caught, controlling what they do better decision making what they do error count comes down by 50 percent uh so yeah it's they've got the tools uh but it's 
will they have the confidence when they play the big games to still go after that style of play? Uh, you know, remains to be seen. But as I say, I think there'll be a there'll be a great indicator when they get to when they get to France. So, Simon, from a coaching from a coaching perspective. Um, how do you how do you um, shape a side's approach to the kind of things we're talking about? I mean, if if you look at the French and New Zealand, and you probably include Japan uh, traditionally in 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 this group, they're distinctive uh, sides, but their depth and timing seems to be absolutely key to the kind of rugby they're looking to play. And the the as you say, the French do make out of a lot of mistakes. It must be the world's most frustrating side to watch because you know what they're trying to do. And it, and when it works, it's the best thing on earth. But they do chuck the ball on the floor quite a lot. Um, the Kiwis less so. Japan are different again. But is that the, the timing and depth of running? Is that a close skill? Is that an attitude thing? Is it, 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 is it, is it bred in the bone? Is it instinctive? How, how do you get to do that? Because Jerry Guscott, who was a pretty great player, says yeah. no matter how many times you watch the French on a video and go out on the training field and try to do the thing that you've just watched, it's very, very difficult to do. Yeah, I, I honestly think it's it, it, it's a combination. It's no one thing. I, I think that the the part of it being bred into you is 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 really important. That's, that's a huge piece. As I say, keep... We keep coming back to this this mindset of being comfortable playing a certain way and playing a, what is at this point in time, or, or for, certainly from an English point of view, we would have looked at it as a high risk type of game, but it's not a high risk game to the French. It's it's an eight in them. It's not a high risk game to the Black Ferns. It's an eight in them. Uh, so I think there's a huge part of it, and then the, then. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the, the the general coaching structure and the general coaching delivery in those nations. It's they 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 probably train very differently to how England would train. So what England are doing now, I I would imagine, because ultimately you are what you train. They'll be shifting their training mindset. They'll be shifting their uh, training approach to build this game uh, that that they want to play. So you know you you get the mindset thing, you get the skill set. Uh, but then you have to condition it, and the conditioning comes from the training schedule and how they go about that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, ultimately, it'll be a combination of, uh, of of all those things. Simon, we're talking about this change of mindset, change of game plan. You very nearly won the last World Cup. Yeah. Now, so what is the motivation for the change? Is it because actually to go one better, we had to beat New Zealand? We have to have this in our locker, or is it we've got a home World Cup around the corner, and the women's game has already achieved a pretty good takeoff, but that could be two levels above, yeah. and we want to produce a, a brand of rugby that sells the game forever. So, yeah. what is the um, internal motivation here to change a game plan that that next time out could have actually won the World Cup anyway? Yeah, it's it's a great question, isn't it? You know, because you you, you look at you know the the way we developed our game, the success we had, uh, and both on and off the field. You know, with the the, the final game, uh, the Six Nations last year, the crowd. So there's there's clearly a market for. That. I mean, ultimately, it's it's it is, it's a really interesting question. Is because it it leads me into this part. I'm going to go right off at a tangent here. It leads me into this part about where they want to take the women's game, uh, because. I think I think it's 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 a little bit of a, a sort of point now where is it about and it's probably it's probably a little bit above it is it about high performance and winning or is it about creating a spectacle that is really exciting to watch and engages a very different type of audience to the men's audience you know the excitement levels at a women's international and I think it's the same with football from the bits I've seen is it's so high, but it's very different. Uh, and no matter who does what, there's generally a massive level of excitement and a massive round of applause, you know, whether it's a, an English success or an English error or it's a French success or a French error. It's all greeted very much with high energy. Uh, and I'm, I'm at that point where I'm a little bit like, there seems to be a, a real 
sort of uh, focus on that side of the game and, and uh, you know, how players are within that in terms of culturally, you know, is it about the experience of playing and the experience of those uh, occasions as opposed to winning trophies? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that makes sense. It's something I've, I've been, it's been going around in my head quite a bit and uh, there's no right or wrong to it. It's whatever puts bums on seats at the end of the day and whatever entertains. Uh, so, you know... I think you could crystallise it is if what's better... Uh, to lose the World Cup final in front of 80,000, 29, 28, or to win the World Cup final in front of 80,000, 15, 14. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm I'm less worried about the World Cup final because I think that that'll probably look after itself to a degree. Uh, what I'm more concerned about is um, is competition, high level competition within a within a showpiece tournament. Yeah, and I think what you've got at the moment, and and I also. His personal view, I think that professional sports about winning, and you look at any other sport, any other women's sport, it's about winning, you know. And I'm 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 not sure that women's rugby will be <clears throat> significantly different in that regard. But what concerns me about the women's Six Nations is obviously the gap in score lines, the gap in capacity at the moment and probably a lot of it to do with the gap in funding and while it's on as you've as you've said you know it's on something of a crest or has been on something of a crest i think that if you get too many blowouts in any sport in the end that enthusiasm is going to give way to a certain amount of indifference yeah and that's for me the point that that's uh, that, that's got to be tackled, and I'll be very interested to hear how you feel about the 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 other uh, runners and riders in the Six Nation, how they're going to come on, and how quickly they're going to come on, because that is going to be significant. Because if it just comes down to France, England, you know, every, every season, that's that's not enough. Or France, New Zealand, uh, England, uh, New Zealand in a World Cup final too. Yeah, Nick, I couldn't agree with you more, and and. I think the reality of this Six Nations is that it's going to come down to France and England again. I think there's no doubt whatsoever on that. Uh, I think that you can see in a way the gaps are closing, but it's going to take it's going to take a lot longer than I think people are anticipating because when they talk about the the the, the nations that are now being funded and pushing uh, their programs on, England is still pushing theirs on even faster. So the gap's going to get bigger. Unless, I mean, I think what it will do is it'll reach a, it, it'll reach a ceiling in terms of the the gap, some of the the, the or the score lines that that uh, turned out simply because set pieces are getting better and defenses are getting better, and if you've got strong set pieces and strong defense, you're going to be able to minimize the damage, and that's what we're seeing in the Six Nations a little bit now. Uh, and and what I would say is, and again, this is this is from the spectator looking in rather than the coach looking in. There's some really exciting games in these Six Nations, uh, and and there's a there's a real angle to every side. Every side has got a really interesting backstory as to why they need to be successful in these Six Nations. Whether it's World Cup qualification, whether it's WXV, whether it's new coaching setups, whether it's the expectation that Wales have created, and now they've got to get back on the horse after after WXV and the start to this Six Nations. So there's there's some really interesting stories, but the over overriding story is that. England are way in front of everybody else. France look like they've stagnated a little bit, but they're very slow starters, France, and there'll be a different kettle of fish on their own patch playing England, I would suggest. But, <clears throat> you know, if, if you were a betting man, you wouldn't go far from England winning another Six Nations and another Grand Slam at this point, and probably France finishing second. The third place is really interesting. Uh, but... That that gap, which then you move on to the world stage in terms of the World Cup, is it going to be any different to New Zealand, England, France? Probably not, as things stand at this moment in time. You know, I feel for Canada, they're they're a really competitive nation. They got they've got some really good players, some great talent, but do they have the funding there? They have the program to keep progressing. Uh, probably not at this point in time. So. Whereas I think there'll be a whole host 
of really entertaining and competitive games, which is what we're seeing in the Six Nations now. Uh, when it comes to the crunch, the, there's probably going to be three teams in it. And, uh, you know, that's that, that's still the reality. I, I think I think with the popularization uh, of of any sport, uh, but 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 certainly certainly in 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 a, in a growing form of of, of rugby, uh, which is where the women's game is at the moment. Part of it is what are your all what do your audience want to see from a game of rugby? I mean, you had twenty thousand at Ashton Gate, and I be so the other day I ran into a, an old Bristol wing who loves watching the women's game. Loves watching the women's game. And the reason he likes watching it, he said, and I, he's not being rude at all, but he said, this is like the game of rugby I, you know, I was familiar with. It's quite position specific. Locks play like locks. Blindside flankers play like blindside flankers. I mean, he, he wasn't trying to demean the game at all. He wasn't saying it was stuck in the arc. What he was saying, there was a distinction to be made between the positions, which made the game quite easy to understand. And he said, and you watch Premiership or international men's rugby at the moment, and it's bewildering because everyone's brilliant in everything. Everyone's jackling. Everyone's making 15 tackles a game, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the women's game is not quite like that. But there are other people who will say, well, we love watching um, England score 12 tries or 18 tries or 104 tries in an afternoon. It's absolutely fantastic. That's why we've bought our ticket. We're English. We want to see England win. And the more they score, the happier we are. And it'll be interesting to see how the audience for the women's game develops and what they expect in general from what they're watching. Yeah, yeah. Mm. What the old blood sport mentality where you go to see somebody get the hell beaten out of them. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, a, I mean, it's a bit Christians and lions, isn't it? I mean, it, it's... Um, I, I mean, that's... Uh, I. I, I could I could see where he was coming from about the the, the position specific nature of the women's game. Uh, I mean, when, when I saw England win the world, no, I get that too. In twenty fourteen, it was twenty fourteen, wasn't it? In 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 Paris, yeah. Yeah. it was that was the thing that really leapt out at me. Was that was that in, in it was quite an easy game to identify what was going on, who was doing what. Who was really impressive? Where the weaknesses in in either side were, etc. And I, and I don't know whether that's uh, I don't know whether that's just being slightly cruel about the women's game or wh whether it's it's praising the women's game. I, I don't know what you think, Simon. Well, I, I think the if you think about whether where whether the women's game is, it's still very early. It's it's accelerating all the time in terms of its development, and 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 I think to be absolutely honest, Chris. It'll probably move quite quickly away from that game you just described, but it's still it's still at that game, that stage of the game. Because certainly, if I talk from an England point of view, <clears throat> the first thing I did when I came in was was look at the team, look at the quality of the players, and go right. They need a structure. They need position specific development. They need unit development. They need to understand the real principles of a game so you can construct a game that looks like rugby uh, with with continuity and with real clear uh sort of facets to it and and uh and so we we just went around building a rugby team based on how I grew up playing rugby and watching rugby which goes right back to what your mate said you know it's it looks like a game from from the the the, the 90s from you know from the the 2000s where it was much more role specific because like what I wanted the players to do is understand what their positions were, how to play their positions, and what a real traditional game of rugby needed to look like. Because it had gone from quite a chaotic, it came from sort of quite a chaotic sort of stage to a, a real stage of that understanding what it looks like, what a game looks like, how you play the game, what my role is within the game. And then now it'll start probably to open up, certainly if they're going to play the game that uh, John Mitchell wants them to play. Because obviously, you know, uh, you know when, when Wayne Smith took over the Black Ferns, he, he was very much like, we're just going to, well, I'm not going to worry too much about set piece. I'm not going to worry too much about the kicking game. We're going to run. We're going to play. And uh, and that's why earlier on a little bit like, oh, you're playing like the Black Ferns. Because that's, you know, I think there's still a, there's still a clear, big emphasis on the set piece and that they'll have to be. Uh, with England, but you know the, the kicking game is diminishing. It's not so much about tactical; it's more about can we create threat? 
uh, and, and and again coming back to the point, it just depends what the audience want to see. Mm. The audience turn if, if England put eighty thousand people into Twickenham to play Ireland, or sixty five thousand, or seventy thousand in Twickenham, well, you know, then and they put that product out and everybody enjoys it and wants to come back again, then they're, they're on a winner. No, but fifty thousand of them will be Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, yeah. <laughs> Forty thousand of them will be Munster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no pressure on Scotty there, <laughs> Beeman. Eh? <laughs> My old mate. Do, 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 you, do you think, Simon, there's any mileage in the in the argument that has been rehearsed recently of 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 women's game specific laws? Oh. <laughs> Got to or, 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 say, or, or, yeah. or, 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 you mentioned or, goal kicking last year. They were absolutely long based. <laughs> <laughs> and they still can't kick from touchline. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, I don't think we need to change. I wouldn't go wholesale on anything. I think there's one or two little tweaks. But I think there's one or two little tweaks in, in the overall game. I, know I, I don't think the game needs to change very much, if at all, for, 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 the, for the women to play as... as you know, as effectively as the men's in their own right. Uh, I agree I, with that, absolutely. Yeah. And I am a traditionalist. I, I absolutely love the game. You know, one or two things I say that, you know, they're always tinkering, and it's understandable, particularly in terms of the welfare of the players at this moment in time. Uh, but when you when you hold one game up against the other, it's I don't think you need to make one different from the other because it's the, the you know, the, the capabilities of the players uh, are very similar, very similar. Simon. One of one of the areas that we we've obviously talked about on this podcast a lot and is coming into view, and particularly in terms of Chris's comments about you know that attractiveness of the of the positional game, you know where it was position against position almost, and the big issue is the bench, yeah. and that is the big issue facing the game, I think, over the next few years is whether they make the changes to the bench. Because at the moment, that is what is altering the game mm. out of recognition. Yeah. And I'm very interested in, you know, it, it has the same implications for the women's game as it does the men's game. Yeah. I'm very interested in your view on that because our view is that lots of coaches, I think Warren Gatland's changed his view recently, but um, that lots of coaches really uh, sort of rely almost on that uh, ability to be able to change half a team in case they've got one or two of their original selections wrong. <laughs> so, so um, what you know, what where do you where do you stand on this? Uh, again, I think the, the there's pluses and minuses in the minuses for both. I mean, uh, what I do immediately is, is go and, and and reference rugby league and what the changes law from the the benches made in rugby league in terms of more more subs, more interchanges, and what that does, and how that how that equalizes uh, teams out, or gives gives teams a, more of a an ability to to play at a sustained level, which which can even things out. I, I think I'd rather see an interchange system. I think, and for a couple of reasons. Number one is because we might stand a chance of beating South Africa in a World Cup final in the men's game if if we go up down that route, as opposed to them just being able to bring on a whole new front row and generally destroy us, which seems to happen. Uh, but it, it's funny because I got asked this question the other day, and, and this is why I got thinking about it. Uh, but what sort of a product do we want on the field? We want one that's safe, but we want one that's entertaining. So if some squads don't have anywhere near the strength in depth that England have got. So be able to spell players and bring players back on on an interchange basis is, is, a, is a really big thing, I think. The other thing is, it's, it's, it, I think it'd be instrumental in the development of players. Uh, and the, the example I'll give is this. If you're trying to develop a scrum half and you're playing a tight game, the player you've got sat on the bench... It's probably either not going to get on at all or we'll get maybe five minutes or 10 minutes at the end of the game. Okay, Because you're thinking, if I bring that player on and it doesn't go well, then I'm stuck. Or you're not going to bring it on at half time uh, if you've got two players of very similar ability. You're not going to bring it on at half time because if she then picks up an injury, then you don't have a scrum half. Mm -hmm. But if you go interchange, then 
You can put one on, take one off if it's not working out. You can put one on at half time if you want, in the knowledge that if you pick something injured, you can bring the other one back on. So in terms of actually developing players, I think it could be quite instrumental. And and that's important for everybody. But yeah. it's particularly important for developing nations. Yeah. It's it, the only thing about it is is it gets it, it can, you know, depending on the numbers involved, it can get pretty incoherent as far as fans are concerned and and so on. And also in terms of the shape of the game very often, you know, I mean, there are frequently in the last quarter games go to pot. Sometimes they don't, but, you know, interchanges can, can, can really bring an incoherence to, 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 to what goes on. So the interchange idea is an interesting one, but the real issue is how many players, who, who, how many players is this a game for? Is it a game for 50? Is it a game for? Is it really a game where we want to be able to change half a team over half a team? Well, I think it's. I, I think the the number of players you've got sat on the bench isn't so much the issue. It's the number of interchanges you're allowed to make. Mm. Be the key bit for me because what you don't want is you don't want uncontested scrums. So you need to have X amount of players on the bench who can cover front row. You don't want the quality to drop by not having playmakers on the field, scrum halves and nines. So you need to cover that. But it does come into play where you can you can limit the amount of changes and then it becomes a coaching challenge and another coach, how you balance those players. Now, you've always got that that injury uh, sort of scenario where you use your interchanges and then you pick up an injury. And maybe that's something to look at how you would deal with that. But I think to have a, a host of players on the bench isn't a bad thing because you can you can cover position by position with high quality, which feeds into the quality of the game, but you can only make X amount. So be, be six or five, as opposed to making seven or eight changes, or maybe four. The, the yeah. argument against it is that the attritional element in the game, and you know, you particularly look at the the forward game, you know, props who work their backsides off for, you know, an hour. Yeah. In order to gain supreme, you know, you know, some dominance over their rival, who's flagging and so on and so forth, and then all of a sudden, you know, on comes Joe Blow, who's as fresh as a daisy, and you know, it that is what's altered the dynamic of the game more than anything. You know, the, being able to bring on, on people who are unable to run for an hour. You know, so they only get 20 minutes or 25 minutes, which is what's happening at a, a huge amount, particularly with forwards. You know, you've got your 25-minute pros. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, for me, you know, is 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 not the picture of the game, certainly that I, you know, that that that, that I grew with. And um, so I, I suppose it's a it's a very fundamental question, really, in terms of uh, where the game goes. It also separates <clears throat> separates out pro rugby once and for all. From every form of rugby beneath it, because yeah. because your your club sides, your local club sides can't do that. They can't have rolling subs. Um, um, well, well, they could, but they'll only have one team. Yeah, yeah it's it, it's it, it's a really interesting question, and it's it's a debate to be had, isn't it? Because it's there's there's so many pluses and minuses to it. Uh, but just uh, when I got asked the question a while ago. I, it just really got me thinking about what difference would it make towards me as a coach and how I could impact on the quality of the game and the development of players. And that was the thing. That's where the scrum half scenario came from. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, oh, yeah, you, 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 you could just have, couldn't you, the the the, the uh, referee and team from Arlequins v Bath, and then you can have as many players on the field yeah. as you want. <laughs> For as long as you want. For as long as you want. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, that, that solves all your problems. <laughs> yeah. the, oh, the, it's a good the, game to be laughed about, isn't it? That's, that's, uh, <laughs> it'll be known as the herbs dispensation. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, can you talk sevens for us a minute? Um, the last Olympics, I thought the women's sevens was one of the outstanding events. Full stop. I thought it was a brilliant watch. Of course, no COVID, no crowd, very little spectacle. This time we're in Stade de France. Um, should be huge crowds. So we're, we're talking about, you know, milestone moments for the women's game. Well, obviously, in terms of England, the Home World Cup is going to be huge. But we've got one right on our doorstep in a, in, a, in a couple of months' time, haven't we, with the Olympics. That could be another huge moment 
uh, for women's rugby. And, and just give us a little bit of a punter's guide as to where we are with the, the women's sevens at the moment and what we should expect. And which of the Red Roses you'd like to see play for the WBA? That's a great question because I haven't followed it whatsoever. <laughs> I, literally, I don't follow the sevens anymore. I got so into the 50s. I, I'm, I'm one of these... I get accused quite a lot by myself, generally, of not investing enough into learning about what else is going on outside the Red Roses. And, and my mitigation was that, well, I just want to concentrate on the Red Roses because I just want them to win and nobody else. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd love to expand, <laughs> give you more information, apart from saying it's in France, it's Olympics, it'll be unbelievable. And... Uh, <laughs> with DuPont playing, no matter whether it's the women's game or the men's game, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal, isn't it? The excitement around it. Just, uh, just the mention of the of the D word, um, DuPont. There, as as a cut of, is he as good as anything you've ever seen? Yeah. Um, what, 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 how, how could you transition from being the best 15s player in the world to be the best sevens player in the world in a month? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was always a commonplace, wasn't it? Um, um, for, for, for any rugby people, if you said who's the best rugby player you ever saw, I mean, probably seven out of ten used to say of a certain age used to say Gareth Edwards, almost as a almost as a just a stock answer. But to to me, I, I think he's I'm increasingly thinking he's he's the best rugby player I've ever seen. Yeah, you, you would you wouldn't argue against that, would you? He's he's just phenomenal. He's what what he does and uh, just the, the threat he creates, the speed he plays, the speed he thinks it, and and what he sees on the field, and his speed of pass is just like phenomenal. And, and he played he, ten for Toulouse last weekend, and, and ripped, ripped up the opposition for Lou Paper <laughs> on more than one occasion. I think Toulouse actually lost the game, but it sure his eggs wasn't his fault. Um, it was. It's, it, it's a remarkable figure. I, I mean, it, it could be transformative for rugby in general on the on the biggest stage of all, if you like, with, with, with the Olympics. I mean, crikey, if he really cooks and France go very deep into that tournament, and it's yeah. a lot to do with him, that could that could send rugby interest through the roof. Yeah, and you know, and, and what a place for it to happen because I think outside England, you know, there's there's no place. Well, well that's obviously a prejudice. Prejudice view outside England, probably France is probably even bigger than England when it comes to supporting and how fanatical they are about stuff. But you know, I think I think you put England and France up there as the two nations that love rugby more than anything. New Zealand talk a great game about loving it, but nobody goes to watch it that much. To be honest, I don't think. <laughs> so, uh, it's like they do, don't they? It makes me laugh. Like they're absolutely fanatical in England and and France, and they I don't think they get anywhere near the the, the amount of. Sort of fan commitment that we, that we, you see over here. I'm glad Brendan brought up the sevens um, because Simon, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I know you don't follow the sevens too much, but so at the moment, GB at eighth in the seven standing, seven series standing out of twelve. They came third in Perth, I think it was. So they've obviously got a good performance in them. But what I'm going to ask you is on the spot, put together your Red Roses sevens team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to name the one that I took to Rio because that's all the one I can think of. Oh, <laughs> right. See, okay. Just out of England players. Yeah, England. Have to, just out of England players that I know. Oh, uh, let's think. Oh, man. Do I have to put them in any order? Or can I just name seven? No, you can name seven. Name seven. Right, well, you put Abby Dow in there, wouldn't you? You know, she'd be the first name on your list. Uh, you put a Meg Jones in there. I think she's she's absolutely super. You put Anna Roland in, and I think how unlucky is that girl? Uh, and yeah. if there's a better, player, a better female player in the world, I don't know where they, she just needs to play more. So that's three. Uh, I would go uh, Alex Matthews uh, would be in there. Zoe Allcroft would be in there. So that's five. Uh, I would possibly put Ollie Hs Ollie Hsen in because she can play nine and and ten. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then Ellie Kildon. Yeah, yeah. That was the name I was waiting for you to say because I was going to ask it. I mean, she's obviously in superb from, from Yorkshire, so I saved the best to last time. <laughs> no, that's not a bad side. I think if if GB were to do well in the summer, I think a few of them would have to transition over um, and do the DuPont and become the best sevens player in the world in, 
in the space of a month because you've got the likes of Portia Woodman and Stacey Wacker um, who are playing for the for the Black Ferns. So, yeah, GB would need a helping hand, certainly. Um, just Do you get the impression that Oliver has read up on this? <laughs> It's I, I it's it all on this one, aren't it? Hey, <laughs> I, I love the seven. We're going to stay on this seven theme. Hey. I'll tell you, Simon. Ask Oliver a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to give my seven, although we should pick a. Oh no, that actually, that's that is a good idea. Go on, give, give us your quick seven. My seven, okay. Uh, your your GB seven or your England seven? England oh. seven. I'd go. I'd go Scarrett as a forward. Um, I'd go, I agree with Zoe Aldcroft. I'd go Kildun, Dow, Roland, Natasha Hunt. How many is that? Six. 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 Um, and I just need a hooker. So even with even with your maths, it's one more. <laughs> I think I'd probably go Marley Packer, to be fair, a hooker. Um, because she does, she's she's quite quick, Marley Packer. Um, <laughs> she's obviously, oh, I, you've got a bit of a pace problem there with that dope. <laughs> I can see where you're going with it. Tactically, it's brilliant. But you're missing him in the pace. <laughs> this is why. This is why he's the coach. Yeah, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. I've never yeah, been asked my opinion anymore. <laughs> in, a, <laughs> in 104 episodes, I've never been asked my opinion on the podcast. <laughs> he's just picked the slowest team in the history of sevens. <laughs> well, well done, true, son. There's a, there's a gold medal there for the taking. <laughs> yeah. I'll stick to my punditry and asking the questions rather than answering them. Um, <laughs> Right, let's yeah, just going back to the thing we were saying about um I was gonna pick Sean O'Brien to speed everything up. <laughs> well done, Chewy. That's another guess we're never getting on the pod. I think she's gonna retire again. Yeah. <laughs> I must be sure his retirement ever that. Really. <laughs> um yeah, just going back to what we were saying and maybe a more technical analysis of the past couple of rounds. I think one of the reasons that England, both men and women, actually have struggled to um, unlock their attack potentially is obviously they've got the pace out wide. We saw that with the men, uh, with the likes of Faye Wilboso and Freeman and how threatening they are. You've just mentioned two names there, Abby Dow and Ellie Kildun, who are obviously absolutely lethal and certainly match Woodman and Tui in terms of threats with ball in hand. I think consistency in the midfield has obviously been a problem with the men for donkey's years. And in terms of the Red Roses... Amber Reed, Emily Scarrett, Zoe Harrison, Helena Rowlands, Holly Aitchison, Lagi Tuama, Tatiana. You know, there are so many names that are in there. Yeah. But we had Claudia McDonald, Sadia Kabir, and Zoe Alcroft on the podcast during the World Cup, uh, the last World Cup. And we were asking them about the fact that we didn't necessarily know what team you were going to come out with every week, and particularly in the midfield. Do you think that's a bit of a key that John Mitchell should lock down in between now and the World Cup so that he can unlock those threats out wide? I think he's tried to do that with Eleanor Rowland at 13. And then that's... And then, then this has happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly what they're trying to do. And I totally understand it because I, I think it, you know, it's, it's a real fair comment. Helena is, for me, she, she was a real conundrum. How to... Where you play her because she was the best, for me, she's the best 10 we've got. I'll tell you that, because she can run, kick. She's a she's a threat on the ball. She can run, kick, pass. She understands the game. She's the best 12. She's the best 13 with Scarabini and Jim. She was the best 15 until Kildun got a form back. Well, I think the 15 bit's been solved, because I think Kildun's the best player in the comp at this, this moment in time, possibly best back in the world at this moment in time. Uh, so I think that's what they've tried to do. They've tried to nail that 13 slot down. And it's, you know, it's and, and that's why I'm I'm number one, I'm really disappointed for for Eleanor because you know she missed uh you know she's missed a lot of rugby through injury and you know, you don't want to see a player of that talent sat on the sidelines. You know, you could see how Rusty Scars was coming back, totally understandable. Uh I thought Tats did exactly what Tats has become very good at doing and made a big difference to how England play, you know, made a big difference to how how Jones can play at 30. And it may be that for this comp, they're going to go Jones at 30 now and she'll be nailed in there. Uh, similar sort of player to Eleanor with a slightly different, more of a run, 
game than 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 Eleanor, uh, but not not much more. So similar players, but I think it's yeah, it, it's it is a conundrum. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because in the two comparison games last year, because obviously there's a lot of talk about England's style and how they're playing at the moment. But I think they've the back three have scored about three tries, and last year they'd scored about twenty. Oh, they scored six against twenty. Dow got four tries against Italy. Didn't get any against you know. So there's something there, isn't there, in the midfield? Again, that's that's not firing at this moment in time. But you know, they're they're they're, they're way off where they were striking in the outside channels last year. No, that's really interesting, and I I I do agree. So you think Scarrett is a twelve going forward then for England? I think it's a good move. I think it's a really good move. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. You know, but you know, you always know she can play the thirteen role. But I think, depending on how you want to play the game, but with the game England are promoting, uh, you need pace and footwork in the thirteen channel, and Roland gives you that, and uh, and Megan Jones gives you it, and uh, you know, you got a good distributor in Scars, uh, and Scars can carry the ball. As well, you know, she's a unit. She can carry the ball really well, and she can kick from twelve. Which you know that if if they want that left right kicking option, if they want that shift it one and then kick, uh, you know. So I, I she's think... the Geordie Barrett of the women's game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Geordie Barrett is the Emily Scarrett of the men's game. Well, that's very right on of you, and congratulations, uh, Ollie. Uh, um, well, well done, but but I mean I think I think Simon makes a really interesting point there. That whole twelve thirteen conundrum is fascinating. How do you want to play the game? What do you, I mean, the the men's game has the it's all over the place in terms of selection, isn't it? It's, it's partly because you don't get many Geordie Barretts around, I suppose, who can pretty much do it all. But it's uh, it, it, I, I love the idea of a second play playmaker at twelve. Well, it, it, as soon as they picked the side for the game, I looked at it and I was like, mm, that's a really interesting. It, it, it smacked of getting all your best players into the back line or all your fastest players into the back line. And I just thought, and I thought at that point in time, the, the back three might not see a lot of ball here because you've got two carriers in midfield, you know, because Jones is a carrier. You know, she's just a different carrier to uh, Tatiana Hurd. And Tats has developed a, a passing game brilliantly. Uh, you know, Meg showed some good touches in terms of distribution, but both of those are runners of the ball. And you know, you, it's it, Kildun was the one who's 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 getting the uh, more opportunities because she's playing one in from the edge. Uh, but you know, if you look at the wings, they got on the ball by going looking for it. You know, Abby Dow went looking for the ball. Jess is not quite as comfortable getting around and looking for the ball as as Abby is, uh, and and didn't you know didn't really they, they didn't really feature as 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 a striking sort of force. She still does it more than Rory Underwood did. Yeah, well, he did okay. <laughs> um, go and in terms of the fly half debate, you mentioned Helen Rowland is the best ten. Mm -hmm. at the Red Roses, I suppose, which is really interesting. I think I'm probably right in saying she's started. A game at 10, 12, 13, and 15 um, for the Red Roses, presumably. So obviously she's got the flexibility to play anywhere. Uh Zoe Harrison, Holly Aitchison, um, question marks over both of their goal kicking. Obviously, I think they're both sub 50% so far. Um well, Aitchison, four, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kicking. yeah, it's it's well, I was surprised and I didn't watch uh, last weekend's game live, but I was surprised not to see Scarrett. Goal kicking. I don't know whether you know what's behind that because she's I, obviously the most natural. Goal well, I mean, Zoe will always put around. I mean, Zoe had a bad day yeah. kicking. She's always usually a really good kicker. You know, she's she's a decent kicker. Uh, but Skaz Skaz will always be the one who goes, "Do you want to kick? Or do you want me to kick?" And she'll yeah. let somebody else take that if they want to take it. Like I literally had to send messages down when I was there. So I told Skaz she's kicking. It's like this is not <laughs> this is painful watching yeah. some of this. Uh but she she's she just so unassuming is scars. And like, you know, and, and she'll know the context of the game. This kick this kick's not gonna cost us this game. And she and if this and if there's an element of let that player build her confidence, because because Zoe's a ten who wants to kick, you know, like Katie was a ten who wanted to kick 
when she wanted to kick, sort of. Uh, Ollie wants to kick. You know, they've got a real appetite for it. So Skaz will step back and go, if that's what feeds your confidence, you go for it. Uh, but if it's a kick to what, win the World Cup final and they're all looking around at each other, Skaz will step up there and go, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but yeah, I, I'd see, I, I was really surprised that he went for, for Zoe in that first game because, you know, the one thing that uh, that Ollie brings is distribution. You know, she's a great distributor of the ball. She's got a real flat, fast, fast pass, and she can pick players on the edge when she when she steps into the line. She's got some really, really good skills. Uh, you know, Zoe's more of a structured player. You know, he kick the ball a mile. Uh, yeah, he clearly wants to have a look at uh, both, but it'd be interesting why. You know, and and he probably mapped all his teams out. He's he's probably mapped all his teams out up to the France game. I used to do first three games. I would just map map all the teams out. And then the second, the last two, just consistency, you know. Best team goes in one one from the last game, and if they perform, you put them in again. And so he's probably got all his teams mapped out. He wants to look at them. Do you say that because you had exactly the same approach? For example, did you know your starting 15 for the Rugby World Cup final at the end of the group stage, for example? Uh, I had a pretty good idea, yeah. 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 But, we, yeah. but we did the World Cup differently. So Six Nations, we would I would go first three games, particularly once it got moved, so you always played France at the end. First three games, rotate the squad, make sure everybody gets some game time, look at your combinations, and then fourth game, pick what we thought was going to go into the last game to get some consistency and, then, and maybe some 50-50 calls. But the World Cup, when we went to the World Cup, I pretty much knew what my best side looked like. We'd we'd done all that, and we went very consistent. We were only ever going to rotate in the in the third game, uh, you know, and uh, so it was a different strategy. I think we are at the point in the episode. First of all, it's been an hour, and I I promised you an hour, Simon. So um, if you want to wrap up, then we keep going. Well, keep going. I, the only other thing I wanted to do with you was our random rugby fifteen, which. I don't think we've done in a while. I can't remember the last time we did it. Actually, maybe the guys can a little bit more. Um, but if Thomas Appleton, you sprung it on him, didn't you? Thomas Appleton, well, very well remembered. Yeah, we I only, it. I only opened your email this morning. Oh, really? Okay. Well, it's a, it's I'm a little bit before we came on. I tell you what, uh, I think I'm ready. Sarah Hunter's random rugby fifteen. Still, we we asked her when she came on at the end of the twenty twenty two Six Nations. Her sticks long in the memory. She had some really weird superstitions about like peanut butter sa- peanut butter sandwiches and things, which I'm sure you'll know a lot better than we do. Uh, but if yours is anything like that, then I'll, I'll I'm looking forward to it. Uh, nickname mids best rugby memory. Ah, uh, the last game at Twickenham, the the France game last year. Yeah. Yeah, nice. most embarrassing rugby memory. Putting the cup on my head. <laughs> Pre-game tune. What was that? that? Pre-game tune. What song would you listen? Oh, to? I'd probably go for "Born to Run" Bruce Springsteen. Post-game meal. Um, Carbonara. Oh, yeah, we haven't had that before. Best player you've played or coached against? Played against Ellery Anley in league. They play against that many top right flight ones in Union. <laughs> and coach best, against coach against, against Johnny Wilkinson. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Best player you've played or coached with? Uh, best player I've played and coached with. Mm. Played or coached with whichever. Coach. That's the quick fire, and it's not really quick fire. It's Daryl Powell was the best coach I worked with. Um, best. Who's the best player you've coached? Oh, I think Skaz has got to be in there. Yeah, yeah. Favourite player right now? What a great question. Well, I've got to say Eleanor Rowland because I've talked about her so much. Rugby idol. Rugby idol. Jonathan Davis. Favourite stadium? <laughs> John Juan, what do we call when we won the World Cup in 2000? Not Eden Park. Uh, Twickenham. <laughs> Twickenham. Favorite gym exercise? Oh, bench press. Nice. <laughs> or guns. Or girls. Or, occupation if rugby didn't exist. Oh, tennis player. Oh, interesting. Okay, nice. When's the last time? Oh, you- good career move, Simon. Yeah, it will be. 
What's the final been... last night in Miami? Oh, man, that's Cena. What a player. A player. Djokovic is out of a coach. Mm. Well, I'll agree with Michelle, they shall. Yeah, no back if you yeah. listen. And, he's, and he's, a really, he, he's a really easy bloke to manage as well, Simon. So, best of luck. <laughs> can, I, can I cut into the... Can I cut into the quick fire one just to tell you a real quick sort of serene moment? Olympics, like we're in the Olympic Village, Rio. We come down in the lift, walk out to go training, and Djokovic is there knocking up with his. You know, it's one of the moments where you know you're at the Olympics. <laughs> anyway, go on, I digress. Did you did you tell him his forehand was crap? <laughs> <laughs> Tackle technique. Get your foot closer. Keep it <laughs> going. <laughs> Superstitions. Sorry? Superstitions. Oh, uh, not really. I'm not many. I think uh, when I played, I always had beans on toast in the morning. I'm guessing the nutritionists don't prescribe beans on toast before a game anymore. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Rugby law you would change. You mentioned there a couple of things earlier. Yeah, get rid of the mark, call. Okay. Interesting. Do you not think that would lead to just people sending to the skies to into into the twenty two more? Mm, no, I don't think so. I think it encouraged people to get back behind the ball carrier and counter attack. And it, it, yeah, no, I, I, I don't. I can't see what it serves. And last thing, best thing about working in rugby. Oh man, I... <laughs> bank holiday Zoom calls. <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely, definitely not bank holidays off. It's definitely not money. I'll tell you that now. Uh, I, it's just a brilliant game, isn't it? I just love the game. I mean, like the, the opportunities to travel and meet people. and Yeah, it's, it's just a game. I'll tell you what, my columnists are going to kill me because I dragged them out of bed at 8 a.m. last Monday as well. So we've had a couple of bad stretches. Um, but yeah, thanks for doing that, Simon. Um, it wasn't exactly, well, we won't call that a quick fire question section. We'll call that a question section. Um, but we will wrap up there. Um, Any man who gets Bruce Springsteen onto this podcast is all right by me. Uh, are you going to see him this year? Uh, I saw, I saw him last year at Villa Park. Uh, I've seen him five or six times. He's just the wow. best entertainer in the world. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I don't think you're the first person to mention Bruce Springsteen, 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 but I can't remember for the life of me who the other one said they listened to Bruce Springsteen before was. I will try and find that out. Um, Willie Anderson, was it? Or may have been. I'll, that's a good place to start. I'll go back and listen after the episode. But anyway... Um, Simon, if you do join up with Japan again this year, all the best with it. I am um, next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Are you actually? Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Well, all the best with that then. Are you flying back out? Yeah. Yeah. Just for yeah for ten days to start with, and then there's a few other things going off. So yeah, looking forward to it. Don't go out for dinner with Eddie because you'll be paying. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I could imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work for him. If anybody asks you, would you like to? <laughs> no, we'll just be mates and chat, thanks. <laughs> right, well, enjoy that. Oh, God. Well, I don't think there's any danger of Eddie listening to this, so I think you're all good. <laughs> oh, we get all right. Eddie, 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 listens, Eddie listens to everything. He's like the Stasi. True, that's true. <laughs> nothing, gets, nothing gets past Eddie. <laughs> You've got to do something if you get up as early as he does in the morning, don't you? <laughs> There's only so much you can analyse. <laughs> well, safe travels to Japan, and it's been great having you on. Um, and, yeah, we look forward to I'm sure you'll be watching. That means you won't be in France for the Six Nations finale, I'm guessing, will you? But oh, I, I don't you know. I, I got I got asked if I fancy going across just to watch it. I'm <laughs> like... Yeah. I'd quite like to do some punditry where nobody seems to want to be interested. Anyway, there you go. Quick plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're listening, there's a name to get on board, and I can come with it with him and, and supply some slow sevens analysis. Brilliant. Yeah, but no, great to you, Simon, and take care. Cheers, guys. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Have a great Monday. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. 
The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday, and to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe to our print, digital, and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.